We're excited for today. We begin a new series called The Heart of the House. And really our goal is to share the vision and values of The Rock over these next four weeks and what God has done here as we celebrate together. Uh, so just want to give a heads up for today's message. I'm going to go a lot of different places in a short amount of time. Uh, my goal here is to share a little bit of some miraculous things that God's done in our recent history, how he's spoken to us as we believe they're prophetic symbols. How many would agree that God still speaks today? Come on, church. So we believe that he speaks in unique ways that we don't anticipate. Thank you, Chip Baslock. You're the best, buddy. It's not coffee or vodka. It's water, I promise. <laughs> so from there. Um, so no, we, we really believe that God's provided in unique ways. And there's a journey. The rock is not done. It's, it's, it's got a future ahead that we believe God's called us to. So I'm going to explore a couple things that God's done uniquely. Then I'm going to take you into a history of how Jesus became Messiah. It's really important that we'll set up kind of the future vision here for the, the rock with our Acts 2 communities and house churches that we'll talk about. So to go a little historical, I shared a different version of this at our leadership summit for our community group leaders a few weeks back. I've modified it today. So uh, the feedback I received was you just got to tell them where you're going so it doesn't seem like a history lesson. So I'm warning you in advance, pull out notes. Everything has a lot of scholarly representation uh, behind it. And if you'd like those notes, you can contact us and many of those will be online. So let's uh, open up a couple passages and then we will pray. So Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 12 and 13. And then I'm going to read Acts chapter 4, verse 13. It's Deuteronomy 32, 12 and 13, then Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Deuteronomy says this, The Lord alone guided Israel. No foreign god was with them. He made him ride on high places of the land, and he ate the produce of the field, and he sustained him with honey out of the rock and oil from the flinty rock. Acts chapter 4, verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence that is active here. We thank you that we have 24 years of celebration where lives were changed and transformed. I am evidence of that. Where we believe that you've called many to significant impact. We thank you for the mission's call on this house. We thank you for opening up the nations and opening up our community. Thank you for the countless hours, the thousands of hours. It's not hundreds, it's thousands of hours given to reach the lost, pray for those in need, help those in our community. We ask God, would you shine your light upon this house, that we would be a city set on a hill, that your church would begin to walk in the boldness it was called to walk in. God, we're believing for signs and wonders and miracles. Lord, we recognize the crazy political climate that we live in. But our allegiance is not to the government of the United States. It's to a king and savior named Jesus. And we stand as citizens of that kingdom and say, your will be done. Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. God, would you give us wisdom and discernment? You've placed us in Roseville, outside of the capital of California. Why do you have us here, Lord? We don't know at times but we trust you. And California is not done doing the work of the Lord. God, we pray for our government. We pray for Gavin Newsom. Holy Spirit, fall on that man. Convict him and break every demonic assignment, every deception and lie that he's believed and is living out. We come against every demonic bill in Jesus' name and say it has no power over your church or this house. Would you strengthen those whose jobs are threatened right now? Father, we believe you are with us. And every time your church is persecuted, power comes. So Father, we stand in expectation that you will do a tremendous work in our midst. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Turn to the person next to you say, get ready. Get ready. So it was the fall of 2015. I received a panic phone call from our facilities manager. He said, Pastor Brandon, it's an emergency. Now, let me just give you a, a premise here. Anytime you say emergency to a pastor, we go to level 10 quick. You want to see me anxious, you say emergency. Because my mind goes to multiple places. I'm thinking hospitalization, marriage crisis, zombie apocalypse. You name it, we've thought about it, right? That's where our minds go. And I said, what's the emergency? It's a big problem. I said, what's the big problem? He said, there are bees in Bonita. 
I said, Bob, that's not an emergency. He said, yes, it is. I said, well, how bad can it be? He said, there are bees everywhere throughout the offices. I said, well, let's just hire an exterminator. He said, that's the problem. We brought one out, and there's no hive to be found. I said, well, okay, what do we do? He says, we need a specialist. I said, well, let's find a bee specialist. We got to find one somewhere. So we call around. It turns out somebody in the church knows this bee specialist in Marysville. So he comes in literally like the Ghostbusters, right? He comes in. He's all mysterious. He says, okay, let's check out this bee problem. So we go up to the offices, and he's looking around the corners. He says, okay, okay, there's entry points. Okay, let's go. I need to go up to the roof. So he goes up to the roof, and as he's there, you ever see somebody that's really cautious, and you, you, you're trying to figure out what they're thinking? He's walking real slow on the roof, right? He says, it's what I thought. I can't believe it. And Bob's like, what? Can't believe what? He said, I can't believe this. I've heard of this, but I've never seen it. We need to go back down to the offices. They go to the offices, and he says, feel this. He puts his hand on the wall, and Bob puts his hand on the wall. He's like, feel what? He said, feel this. And he grabs Bob's hand, presses it to the wall, and Bob's hand indents into the wall. And he says, the reason there is no hive is because the bees have turned Bonita into its hive. <laughs> He's like, what do we do? And he said, we're going to come at night, suited up. This is like a men in black situation. <laughs> we're going to come at night, suited up. We're going to have smoke guns. I mean, this sounds like a discotheque party, right? And he says, we're going to come in, we're going to remove all the panels of the wall, and we're going to remove the hive. Bob says, let's go. It's not this Bob, a different Bob. Pastor Bob would say, no way. Pastor would even say, <laughs> he said, sorry, I'm out of here. So they, they suit up. It's nighttime. They, they bring in another facilities guy to come in, and they're all suited up. They have the smoke guns. They open up the walls, and as they open up the walls, the walls are dripping with honey. I mean, dripping, dark, thick honey. He said, grab the buckets. So they grab the buckets and they start taking shovels and they start scraping honey off the walls into these buckets. You know, this bee harvester is like, I got a score in this honey, right? So he takes that asbestos honey, most likely, right? As it is in this <laughs> different jars. They clear out all the bees, seal up the walls, and we think our problem is solved, right? Well, we didn't think anything of it. It was just a weird excursion. Who has honey in the walls of their church? Well, a few months later, our friend Sean Smith comes out to speak at the church. If you've ever heard Sean before, he's a well-known evangelist. He, he, he operates in the prophetic, but he wouldn't say that's his primary gift. And as he's speaking on a Sunday morning, I'm sitting next to Bob. He says, I just get this strange, strange word. And I, I just have to share it. The Lord says there's honey in the rock. And I think it's a verse somewhere, but there's honey in the rock. So I pull out my Bible. I'm on Google. I'm searching honey in the rock. And I come across Deuteronomy 32, 12 and 13. And he ate the produce of the field and he sustained them with honey out of the rock. I look at Bob, I'm like, there's honey in the rock, Bob. There is honey in the rock. So after service, I go up to Sean. I'm like, Sean, that was the word of the Lord. He's like, bro, that was a weird word. He said, no. I said, it's the word of the Lord. Sean, you understand? You know when you get so excited, like words don't make sense? And you're like, and then, and then, and then, right? So I'm talking to him, I'm like, there's honey in the rock, Sean. He's like, yeah, man, it's yeah, great verse. I'm like, no, you don't understand. There's honey in the rock. There's bees in the rock. And he's looking at me like, I'm like, hang on one second. Let me get this. So I run upstairs. I'm like, Sean, there was literally honey in the rock of Roseville. They were in the walls. Honey was dripping from the walls. And this is the honey that we extracted from our walls. He's like, that's the word of the Lord. I said, I told you it was. So we take this verse and see honey is this dominant symbol throughout the whole Testament of God's abundance. And God has promised us to live an abundant life. The problem with the word abundance is we look at it in a Western worldview, which means materialistic blessing. God has called all of us here to live an abundant life. And that's coming from the mouth of a Messiah that was not living in luxury. Foxes of the, uh, uh, have holes, birds of the air have nests. The Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. There was access to something greater than material possession that Jesus' spirit offers. I took a John class from a scholar, and one of the main themes is abundance. And he said, I don't know if you understand this, 
This is megas abundance or mega or great abundance that God's spirit provides. He says the best picture to get you to understand the abundant life that God's spirit provides is, you ever go to one of those yogurt places where you get to fill your own cup? Love those places, right? He says, imagine getting the, the largest cup you can get and you go up to the yogurt machine and you pull down the lever and right when it fills up, it just keeps going and going and going and you don't stop holding down the lever. That's the abundance that Jesus' spirit is promising to us. That's the picture of provision, that we have access to a spiritual inheritance that's far greater than any materialistic possession. That's what the abundance looks like. God promised honey and abundance in the rock. Well, we moved on from that, 2015, 2016. We'll move on further. A friend gives me a dream and says, God says there's honey in the rock rose. I was like, yeah, I've heard that story before. He said, no, I had a dream that the stages were dripping with thick honey. Find out he's not aware of this story. And he says, God said that he called the steward because many were walking on the stage not recognizing the value that they had and the value that what they were standing on. I was reminded again, God has given us a history to stand on those that have gone before us in this house where we are not those that look around, but we are those that see further because we stand on the shoulders of giants, as Isaac Newton said. We have the ability to see further because of that. Well, the part of this verse that I never understood was oil from the flinty rock. I thought, okay, what does that even actually mean? And as we went on, time went on, I had a significant dream last year. How many would identify 2020 was the hardest year of their life or a friend's life? Everything wrong happened in 2020 for many people. Well, in the middle of the crisis, I have this obscure dream. And in this dream, I'm with national leaders in a house. Thought that was symbolic. Persecution is broken out on the church in America. It's a time of crisis. And as we look to the leaders, no one knows what to do. And I looked to the person that was leading the room and I say, I have the word of the Lord. He said, now is not the time. As they continue to talk, he looks at me and says, share your word. And I stand up before these national leaders and I say, listen, the enemy has come to steal the oil of the church. Just like in the movie, There Will Be Blood. And I will not go into this again. I've done it before. It's a very long movie and I give the whole plot line. See, just like Daniel Plainview stole all the oil of the city, the enemy has come to steal the oil of the church. But we, like the ten virgins, must prepare and buy oil now. Behold, we must buy oil now. I wake up from the dream. That sounds like Jesus, right? Well, I begin to study oil, and the Lord brings me back to this verse. Oh my gosh, oil from the flinty rock. Oil from the crag. And I come across this scholar's note in a commentary. It says this. Oil from the flinty rock may refer to olive trees going in places otherwise unable to produce fruit-growing trees. This is a promise that infertile places would be rich with produce in God's land. God has called his church to have oil, the symbolism of anointing, that no matter what the environment is, no matter how infertile the ground, God will produce his works and ways in the midst of his church and his people. Well, my friend doesn't know that I'm studying this. And provoked by another, Amy Patterson has a vision. She says, Brandon, I, I've, I've been afraid to share this with you. My friend told me I had to share it. And she sends me this word as I'm studying this. There was a huge olive tree. There were huge olives on all the branches of that tree. The olive tree was planted in a rock on a hillside. There was a huge crack in the rock, and the center of the rock had been crushed. But in the crushing process, the roots were able to grow in size and grow deeper. On each side of the tree were two streams of water. The roots traveled deep down into the ground, tapping into both streams of water. As this took place, I also saw oil from the olives dripping down the tree, down the roots into the water. As the oil reached the water, the tree caught fire. Although the tree was on fire, it wasn't being burned. The fire was bright, fierce, and not damaging. God has called his church that in the midst of crushing, did you see that part of that? The rock was crushed. How many would symbolize that they had crushing take place in their life last year? In the midst of persecution, in the midst of difficulty, God is releasing an oil of anointing that will enter the waters. That's the streams of the nations. 
That God will send forth an anointing to reach those that are unreached and reach those that go beyond the stream of this house. God has called you to live a fruit-filled, anointed life that has access to the abundance of God's Spirit. That's what's on this house. That's what this church is called to. As I studied olives, I could not believe all the symbolism that when a tree finally produces a ripe olive, the, the farmer would come with a rod and strike the trunk of the tree. And when they would beat the tree, the first fruit would fall. Because if they began to pick olives that weren't ripe and ready, they weren't ready for the pressing. So when they would remove all the olives, they would enter them into the olive press. And that first pressed oil is the sweetest and most fragrant oil, but it has to enter the crushing. For a lot of you last year, you experienced a crushing. You experienced that place where you felt like you were squeezed, but God was releasing a fragrance in you that was priceless. A fragrance in you that was powerful. See, this symbol of oil is a dominant theme throughout the entire Old Testament. And they believe that this symbol was actualized in a person they called the Mashiach. We translate it the Messiah. This Messiah would be the anointed one, or the crude translation is the smeared one. See, they believe that this person would carry promise and would deliver Israel from all their oppressors. Now, what, to the surprise of many of us, there were actually several that claimed to be Messiah in the midst of the Roman rule. The year was 30 AD. The Roman and Jewish relationship was in an all-time high of tension. And there were a few people that claimed to be Messiah. And what they would do is they would claim to be Messiah, but when Rome would get word of the Messianic claim, they would clamp down, they would send in military, and they would crucify that insurrection leader as they would crucify them as an example of do not come against Rome. Do not challenge Rome. So from this place, the Jews were left without hope. They were discouraged, lost, hopeless, until the son of a carpenter, unexpected, entered Galilee and made a declaration. Mark chapter 1, verse 15. He said this, The time is fulfilled, And the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, to the Jews, this was not just the closing line of a Billy Graham crusade, right? This was a significant declaration. This was a declaration of war against Rome. The Messiah would say these words, and it meant it was time to gather together for war. It was time to gather together and assemble your team. And what you would normally do is you would begin to assemble your military team. But what was unique about Jesus is he begins to fulfill and back up his declaration with signs and wonders. Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 1, verse 32. And they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons, and the whole city was gathered together at the door. Make note, where do they gather? They gather at a house. They gather at a house. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Just like Isaiah 35, eyes of the blind are open. Just like Isaiah 61, the oppressed are set free. And the whisper of, is this and can this be the one, begin to go throughout all of Galilee. Because before, there were those that claimed to be Messiah, but no signs and wonders. So they said the signs and wonders were symbolic. Jesus made them substance. And from this place, he begins to set the oppressed free and he goes up to a mountain and he picks his team. We talked about this. He would assemble politicians. You would get a military commander. You would get people that are prepared for government takeover. But who does Jesus choose? Mark chapter three, verse 13. And he went up to a mountain and he called to them whom he wanted and they came to them and he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles to be with him. And they sent him out to proclaim the message, and he gave them authority to cast out demons. These were not lawyers. These were not politicians. These were fishermen and tax collectors. These were the people least qualified to lead a government takeover. No one would ever pick this team. Were you ever on a childhood sports team where people would go and they would pick people? They were the worst pickers of people. You know that? You would be stuck on the team with a guy that didn't know how fast or strong other people were. We pick bad people. See, Jesus doesn't pick the San Francisco Giants. He chooses the Sandlot. See, Jesus doesn't choose the A team. He chooses the Goonies. 
We're talking the island of misfit toys. That's Jesus' team. That's who Jesus picks. And he takes this band of misfits and he gives them authority. Here's what's crazy. That word authority, exousia, is a dramatic word used. It was something that you would give to somebody. It literally means this. They have power without any hindrance or opposition. See, someone that had exousia, they would literally use it to describe the crows and the ravens that would fly without resistance and knew no bounds. He gives them that authority and he backs it up and they do the same works he did. And guess what? They didn't earn any of it. That, my friends, is what we call grace. Caris. It's a gift. He gifts them exousia. Now, this was not the consensus of the people. People were not cheering on Jesus and what he was doing. So much so that his family calls him crazy. Mark chapter 3, verse 21. And when his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. They literally are trying to arrest Jesus and put him in an asylum. That's what this is implying. And they said, for the people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. The word here for out of his mind is one word, extemi. It's where we get the word ecstasy. Literally. And it's, it's like Jesus is out of his body. He's gone crazy. They, they are literally communicating he is a danger to himself and others. But Jesus evades the crowd. He moves on. This becomes so divisive that John is actually the one that best records this. It says in John 7, 5, that his brothers publicly rejected him and rejected the call in his life. So literally, you not only have the opposition of the Pharisees and Sadducees and many others, you now have your brothers saying, I lived with him. He's not the one. That's what's taking place. But they cannot deny the ministry and the power that Jesus is walking in. So what takes place? John 19, we see that Jesus on the cross entrusts John the apostle with his mother Mary. Why does this happen? This is what many people don't know. We lose it in translation here. The main reason is this, because Jesus' family have rejected Mary as their mother as well because she's given allegiance to Jesus. So his family said, Mom, if you want to follow him, you're not with us. And he has to entrust his disciples, John, with, to take care of his elderly widowed mother. That's what's taking place. This is the situation we're facing. However, Luke changes the story. As we know that the resurrection takes place, there's a subtle comment he makes that is truly profound in Acts chapter 1, 13 and 14. Here's what happens. It says, And they went to the city, and they gathered together to pray in an upper room, and it lists the apostles. But verse 14 says this, as they constantly prayed together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. What happened? The resurrection was so real and so convincing that his brothers humbled themselves and gave allegiance to Jesus and welcomed their mother back in. That's how significant the resurrection is. You can talk to apologists and they'll try to prove the resurrection. We believe that the New Testament is historical documentation. The problem is when we look at historical documentation, we look at the Bible as a whole. That's not how documentists actually look at this. You have to look at each epistle as a record of history. So when you break that up, one of our greatest proofs of the resurrection is actually found in one epistle, the epistle of James. Why is this? We find that James is the apostle of the Jerusalem church in Acts 12 and Acts 15. So from this, what does it say? James 1 opens up. James, a slave of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. James now refers to his brother as his savior. Normally when a Messiah would die, his brother would take over the claim and they would anoint the oldest brother, the one to succeed them, but James is acknowledging his brother came back from the dead. Not only James, but his brother Jude 
in Jude 1 says the same thing. The resurrection was real, my friends. So much so that James was thrown off the temple court and died a martyr in AD 62 because he believed the resurrection was real. They no longer referred to him as brother, but king. From this place, we see the New Testament church take over the Roman Empire. They literally take over the Roman Empire. In 300 years, they see the complete transformation of Rome, so much so that the famed historian, Rodney Stark, who was not a believer, said that 51% of the Roman Empire before Constantine legalized it became Christian. It's a big deal. Transformation takes place. And people wonder, why did the gospel spread? Why do they have so much power? How did they do that? People have analyzed this for centuries, but it's found in one simple verse that many overlook. Acts 4.13 says this. And behold, now they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, and they were astonished, and they recognized, this is the key, they had been with Jesus. Were they educated? Nope. See, the world doesn't need your education, they need your transformation. The world is in desperate need of a church that is living, real, and active. They don't need our entertainment. They need an encounter with a living God. And it doesn't come from those that are qualified, but disqualified. Here's the deal. No one's accepted on the team unless you have a messed up life. If you think you got it together, find another church. Jesus says, you're imperfect. Good, I'm perfect. I'll make you perfect. He comes and meets us in the lack. He's not looking for the arrogant. He's not looking for the overqualified. Jesus grew his church, his ecclesia, not through the hands of professionals, but the people. He removed the power from the professionals, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and he gave it back in the hands of the common men. Those that were uneducated, unequipped to see the world change and transform. But the key is this. You had to be with Jesus. If we're going to see a church that sees a olive tree light on fire, we have to spend time in his presence. He's called us to live from a place of abundance. He's called us to live from a place of anointing. And when we begin to understand what he paid for, we'll walk in the authority the disciples did. Because he paid for it on the cross. We all have access to it now. A, fame, a mentor that's passed gave me this word once. He says, listen, the journey of the Christian life is discovering the mountain of victory you stand on. The journey of the Christian life is discovering the mountain of victory that you already stand on. And the way they took over the world, the way they saw transformation was not a temple gathering. It was at the table, my friends. And they begin to open up their homes as we recognize in Acts chapter 2. And house to house, they saw transformation take place. They saw signs and wonders move. We believe that this church is called to see Acts 2 communities in every neighborhood throughout greater Sacramento. That as we begin to have Acts 2 communities that are emerging with uneducated, common people, we will see the power that Jesus promised in the neighborhoods he's called us to reach. Right now, we have 11 amazing communities. Here's a picture of what we have. We believe God's called us to double this by next year, that we will see in every surrounding area, you can show the next slide, Acts 2 communities throughout every area in our region. The only way that's accomplished is if you answer the call. If you feel unqualified, good. That's a prereq. Feel uneducated? Good. Neither are Sean or I or Pastor Bob. Mark's got the college education. <laughs> Dr. John makes up for it all, so that's fine. <laughs> he is looking for those that are normal to do supernatural things. This is the call of this house. And as these Acts 2 communities take root, and we see the anointing start to move. God's going to awaken a calling in many that are sitting here and watching online. Those that have moved away that still are part of this house, you're going to be a part of what God's doing. That call to be a pastor, 
will awaken in you. That five-fold gift that we believe is still working today because our job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And from that place, you will begin to fulfill and see, and we will see many of these Acts 2 communities become house churches. The Rock of Roseville, that we know the original vision was to plant a thousand churches. We believe that same vision's apart, but it's changed. It's been modified. The church, the rock, will be a church of house churches. Then when you come on a Sunday, Sunday's not going away. It will be a gathering place that represents many more communities throughout the region. When you watch online as we build our online community that we'll be launching this fall, you'll be a part of a network of churches that meet and gather in homes and buildings on occasion. Now we know when we say house church, lots of complication comes up. People say, what about the finances? What about church structure? We know it comes with questions and we are seeking to solve them. But church, if we don't take a risk right now, the church that you've known, capital C in America, it's going bye-bye, friends. Let last year be the wake-up call. And God has been preparing this house to think about what the future holds. And it starts with many here responding to the call that God's already been stirring. Let this be words that affirm what God's been communicating. Let's stand together as we share this last passage. I was sent a video by a friend this week. And he said, uh, this is a prophecy. We don't know when it's from. It's probably written, recorded in the last 10 to 15 years. He said, I believe this portion is for you. And as I listened to it, I just wept before the Lord. You know when there's those words that come at the right time in the right season? How many have ever received a word before and it's old and you come back to it and it feels fresher than it ever has been? So I start listening to it. I try to find it. It's not written down anywhere. And as I'm praying, the Lord just said, you need to, you need to pray this over the house of this church because he's going to unlock things inside of us. Now I've removed the name of this prophet because anytime you bring up a prophet's name, we look at the man, not the message. And that becomes distracting. Listen, the problem why we don't receive a lot of prophets anymore is because we've given them the place of teachers and theological experts, which they're not. They're supposed to be prophets. And that's a misuse the church has done. So from that, I want us to close our eyes and just put our hands on our hearts. I'm going to read a portion of what was spoken. Holy Spirit, come. You're already here, but bring a greater awareness of your presence. Just right now, prepare your heart to receive from this. Let the Lord do something. This is your moment. We're not a ministry leader. Not a prayer team member's laying hands. The Holy Spirit's laying hands on you right now. Jesus, send your angels in this house. Each and every one of you have gifts. And it's time that not only one or two gifts are revealed. But the whole body is called to walk in the gifts. When we were saved, gifts were given to all. You see, the real fathers are going to unlock the gifts that have been imprisoned in you by a religious spirit all of these years. You have many teachers, but not many fathers. The real fathers are going to unlock you. They're going to turn loose sons and daughters. Every one of you has a different gift. If you all come together, we have the whole shebang. The gifts have been imprisoned, listen to this, by the religious spirit. Legalism, opinion, debate, judgment, and criticism. These are the five things that religion is. What God is after is his own system. Prophets, apostles, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We're going to need that anointing. It is the calling, not the mantle you need. You need the calling and you need to answer the call. Do not seek another's mantle. We only need one of that kind. We only need one of me. We need one of you. We need all of you coming together. Many are called, few are chosen. Every born again Christian has a calling. And when you answer the calling, you will answer it in the furnace of affliction. Isaiah 48, 10. Behold, I've refined you, but not as silver. I've tried you in the furnace of affliction, says the Lord. If you hang on to then that furnace, then you are answering the calling and you also will be chosen. When you answer the calling, it's like the opposite happens to you. 
the testing, the trials, the persecution. You continually try and are tried like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But when you answer the call, you'll have an experience in the furnace like they did with the fourth man. You determine your destiny by your faithfulness. And when you are faithful and hang in there, you will come out of the desert sooner or later. And when you come out of that desert, you come in to the promises of God. Holy Spirit, I thank you for my friends and my family. Unlock their hearts. We bind and break the deception of the religious spirit. We come against legalism and criticism and all those things that would interfere with the call. And we say, release your church to walk in true power and true anointing. God, we believe you're going to raise up a church that's not bound by legalism or restriction of the government, but a church that cannot be contained like you did in China and you are now doing in Afghanistan. God, you would do a work that cannot be stopped by anything the government would require. But God, you're releasing your sons and daughters to be apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, and pastors. God, do your work. Have your way. Holy Spirit, move in and throughout this body. We thank you for 24 amazing years in this house. But God, we're expecting it's not this house, but houses you're going to release. So Holy Spirit, do your work. Have your way.